So I think we can start. I mean, uh, um, thank you for coming to this seminar, which is a very uh, exceptional seminar, in fact, because uh, it is in the context of the uh, agreement between Collège de France and Collège National, uh, which is the equivalent, in fact, in, in Mexico. And um, it's a beautiful place. I mean, uh, you should visit. I mean, I hope many of you will visit, and uh, many professors will go there as well, I hope. Uh, I will myself uh, travel to Mexico in April. Uh, um, and uh, 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 it's a great pleasure that we start this series of uh, exchanges uh, by the conference by Ranulfo. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Ranulfo is an old friend of many others. I mean, Ranulfo was, got his PhD in Mexico, his uh, MD in Mexico, but he got his PhD in, in Paris in 1985, uh, something like that, right? And, uh, uh, and then he did a, a, a the first postdoc with Jacques Lewinsky uh, uh, at the Collège de France, and this is where we, we met first time, right? Um, he went to uh, um, Fribourg, and uh, then he went to uh, United States, where he did a second postdoc with uh, Vermont uh, Montcastle. You know, for the neurobiologists, I mean, Vermont Montcastle is sort of, you know, the epitome of excellence in uh, neurophysiology and uh, brain sciences. And he established himself as a full professor at UNAM in Mexico in uh, 1989. And he's been uh, there since as full professor. I mean, uh, the work that he has done is, you know, just, I mean, worldwide recognized. And, uh, uh, and he has so many awards and recognition marks, including the National Academy of Sciences. I mean, at the, in the United States, that's, uh, I cannot tell all of them. I mean, will you excuse me, Ranulfo, because this will take the rest of the conference. And I don't think we need that. We need to hear you. And he's very famous for his work on the analysis of the uh, <coughs> decision-making, more or less, in, in, in the monkey. And uh, uh, the uh, multisensory uh, information and how this multisensory information in the cortex can travel through the cortex, premotor, motor, sensory, to finally, I mean, uh, um, allow the, the animal to make a decision. And, and this is a, a, an exceptional, I mean, uh, achievement that is done. And this is why we're very honored and very pleased, uh, uh, Ranulfo, that you accepted our invitation. And uh, um, I would leave you the chair. But before I leave you the chair, I have a little token of the recognition of the Collège de France, which is a little middle. You have to carry back to Mexico, oh, okay? <laughs> Bon, c'est un véritable plaisir d'être ici parce que ça a été ma maison. Et je suis ravi de voir Marie-Jo Besson, que c'était c'est une femme qui m'a beaucoup aidé ici euh, à Paris pour euh, m'en sortir et, et terminer mon doctorat d'État avec Jacques, qui a été formidable. Et vous pouvez voir que depuis beaucoup de années que j'ai quitté Paris, on est encore des amis. Et je garde une très grande reconnaissance pour tous les deux. Et pour tous les amis que je fais ici, et, et ma surprise, c'est qu'Alain, qu'on s'est connu au début des années 80, on est encore euh, là. Et je suis ravi et je m'excuse de ne pas parler euh, en français. Mon français s'est bien abîmé depuis beaucoup de, de années que je ne parle pas. Au Mexique, on parle espagnol et on est forcé de parler en anglais et d'écrire nos travaux en anglais aussi. Si vous m'excusez, je vais essayer de parler en spanglish. Bon, uh, I thought it might be good to in uh, introduce myself with a very uh, simple talk, which give you an idea of what we do in Mexico. And I'm, again, I'm very happy to give, deliver the first lecture of this agreement that we have between Collège de France 
and our uh, national college. Uh, it was very quickly recognized, humans recognized, that the brain was uh, the organ of the movement and of the mind. And this was recognized simply because when the brain was damaged, uh, humans lost vision, hearing, capacity to move, and of course, for the mental uh, capabilities. Nowadays, is, is clear with new techniques that uh, in non-invasive technique in which uh, based on a lot of computations coming from physics and mathematics and by the facts that cells, not only neurons, but glia cells, consume a lot of oxygen and glucose and some other things. But when you see words, you don't have to mentally do any effort. This part of the brain is um, activated, consume a lot of oxygen and glucose, and this is what it's called the, the visual cortex. And if you are hearing me, not listening to me, certainly this part of your brain is active, is the auditory cortex. And because I'm trying to generate words in English, this part of my brain is active. And because I'm executing this generation of words, I'm speaking is no more than the, the primary motor cortex. However, there is a, an important problem in neuroscience in what it concerns to me and to many people. And this is how does the brain represents information from the different sensory modalities. In this case, in the visual field, there is uh, an object, which is, um, is, is something, uh, every time that I pr uh, present this slide, my wife disagrees with me whether this, uh, what kind of fruit is this. But this fruit, which is in front in the visual field, is, is seen by the brain, originally by, because the object is represented in the activity of brain cells in the visual cortex. This object is very complex because it has the form, size, texture, color, and if there is some air, it might move. And this is, and all this computation is made by the cerebral cortex, is what we think, going from the retina the thalamus, and finally entered here. But there are many brain areas involved in this brain function. By the way, this is a very complex problem, which cannot be studied easily with just by um, measuring the consumption of oxygen and glucose. We need to go to brain cells and to many brain cells and see what are the computations that allows the brain to produce an image, because the image is here, is not here. The object is simple, activating the retina. Many years ago, when I was at John Hopkins, a friend of me who passed away, unfortunately, one of the most clever person I ever met in my life, his name was Ken Johnson. He tried to answer this question, how does the brain represent, for example, the four complex objects in the brain? And he designed an apparatus in which a drum, over the surface of the drum, there are letters, complex, the forms. And because the fingers of monkeys and our fingers are practically similar, the skin and the cutaneous receptors are similar, the only differences between the, the fingers, the monkey fingers and my finger is that I wash my hands every day that the monkeys do not. But when you stimulate the fingertips, you produce activity in the cutaneous nerves that go to the brain, and you can try to answer the question which is hard to address in the visual system. So this, um, this, this apparatus, this stimulator, can move the drum in the, in the Z direction, which is up and down, and then the Y and X axis in such a way that on the, in the fingertip you can move the letters 
and do recordings in the primary afferents and see what information go from the external world to the brain. And this is what enters, what you can have in the primary afferents, which you know in the textbook is slowly adapting because they adapt very slowly to the stimulus. By the way, these are the responses from the slowly adapting axons, rapid adapting corresponds to D and uh, Pacini in, in down here. So this reconstruction is made just by many uh, scanning on the cutaneous receptive field and at the end, uh, Ken Johnson got an event plot, which is this. So he came to the conclusion that for this type of stimuli, these two afferents might be important for sending input to the brain because this is the only information that receives the brain. The inputs coming from the periphery have to be translated or transduced by the receptors, no matter whether it is the cochlea, no matter whether it's in the olfactory, in the gustatory system, or in the visual system. So with this technique, he went to the primary somatosensory cortex, just at the top, and wanted to compare the images obtained in the primary afferents with those um, um, produced but nerve cells using exactly the same technique and the same stimulus. So you can go to the primary somatosensory cortex in the primate brain, and you will see that in area 3B, for example, you have a territory that, um, that extracts or represents inputs from the skin from D1, digit 1, D2, 3, 4, 5, and you can go easily with this technique, which has been very successful, still very successful, in which we can approximate with a microelectrode to the, the, the soma and pick up the electromagnetic fields. And because it's very simple, action potentials can be translated to zeros and ones and, and, and do exactly what Ken Johnson did with the primary afferents. And this is what he found. This is almost is thus are for this slowly adapted because they suddenly came to the conclusion that these neurons were the most important uh, for encoding the form of complex stimuli. And you will see that you have this kind, almost DA, B, C, et cetera, et cetera, and different representations, and came to a very interesting conclusion that this kind of representation might not be important for perception and for very complex functions, perception, memory, on decision making, whatever you can imagine. And he thought, uh, I discussed a lot with him, that eventually this kind of representation might be the most important one from a quasi-isomorphic uh, representation, almost equal to the form, to an ino an isomorphic representation. And so I asked to Ken Johnson, how did you come to this conclusion? I don't know, I simply, I'm thinking about this. And I thought at that moment that it might be good <coughs> to think in using different type of stimuli, different type of approach, approaches. Because when Ken Johnson wanted to use this kind of stimuli to uh, adapt to a behavioral task, that collapsed. He couldn't continue because the monkeys had difficulties to understanding what is an A, what is an B, and C, etc., etc. In fact, monkeys do not read. Monkeys uh, eventually could um, understand, extract some information from a spatial stimuli in the skin, very simple discrimination task. But do you know in the braille, reading is very easy to use the patterns and if you are trained, you can do as well as with the visual system. So, I jumped to, uh, well, and in fact, I discovered in Mexico City very quickly that this was due to uh, this isomorphic representation because neurons in the cerebral cortex uh, had preferences for the direction and the speed of the stimuli. If you scan, 
uh, prof across the cutaneous receptive field, you will see that the neurons have preferences for the stimulus and also they use a uh, preference direction, speed of the direction of the stimulus. The vector you can see is much better when it is uh, in this case. So, the, an explanation for the inosomorphic representation of Ken Johnson was simple that he was not uh, scanning the letters in the right and um, speed uh, direction of the stimulus. So he reviewed my paper and he agreed with me and I jumped to the behavioral test because I think it's, it's more relevant. And when I jumped to this, uh, to this task, most of, of my friends, uh, Ken Johnson said, Romo, you are crazy. Monkeys do not discriminate by their tactile stimuli. Monkeys do some other important things. So I told them that monkeys didn't care about letters too. So I decided to do my own experiments in Mexico. And in the, first, in the second part of my talk, I will show you the behavioral task we use in Mexico, which is very comparable to one um, in, in, in the 80s, uh, Tony Motion and, and Bill Newson adapted in the visual system for a, a simple uh, motion discrimination, dot motion discrimination task in the visual system. So this is our subject. It's a recent monkey sitting in a monkey chair. And we use the somatosensory system to deliver the stimuli. And the monkeys um, stay for hours in the lab. They are trained to stay still. And there is a ferula that uh, restrains motion forward and backward and lateral movement. And we managed to have uh, the palm and fingers up in such a way that we can stimulate the skin safely from trial to trial in a very parametric way. So the monkeys stay like this for hours if they were begging for money. And their money are stimuli delivered to the fingertips, to the skin. So monkeys do not speak, of course. They use a pad, a sensitive cut to the touch, and a couple of push buttons. And a given trial, the stimulator uh, travels in the air and um, in an about 80 milliseconds touches the skin and produces a very gentle indentation, pressure, constant pressure. And there is a burst of activity and travels for the cutaneous nervous, goes to the upper part of the spinal cord, then to the thalamus, and finally to the cerebral cortex. And of course, there might be a touch representation. And in response to this, the animal responds very quickly. Information reaches the cerebral cortex in 20 milliseconds, and the monkey in about 200 milliseconds produces a voluntary action because it's responding to this. It's exactly what happens when I go to the, walk into the skin and somebody uh, calls me Ranulfo. If I like, I turn my hand, and I don't like, I don't hear, and I continue. So the monkey can do exactly the same. If they like, they place their hand, and they don't like, they simply don't do. But the question is, what kind of neural operations occur in the cerebral cortex or in the whole brain to produce this voluntary action Probably Stanley Lance can tell me how this happens. But if somebody responds to these very simple questions, can win? Of course. I, I counted the other day 90 Nobel Prizes. There is a Nobel Prize that won a Nobel Prize by studying one milligram of tissue by plasticity and learning and something like that. So the monkey brain weights about 90 grams, so you can count how many milligrams there are there. But these simple questions has not been answered as I will not answer the title of my talk. So, so the monkey stays like this and then comes superimpose a gentle vibration. Who care about vibration? I care, you will see why. And this lasts 500 milliseconds and uh, it can vary in the flutter range, which goes from 5 hertz to 40 hertz, and in which brain cells respond very nicely to this stimulus. And the monkey task is simply to pay attention to this. The stimulator stops, and after a delay period, we can last from 1 to 15 seconds. 
by convention in the laboratory, we use three seconds because monkeys don't like waiting and have long trials because they are bored. They go to the lab to get reward, not to do this task. Then comes a second stimulus um, which lasts exactly the same, but can vary in frequency. And the monkey task here is very simple, to tell me whether this frequency is higher than this one. And for you, it's very easy because you are seeing the pulses. But this is not seen. This is sensed by the fingertips. And when you do this task, you will see how difficult it is to do this. And then, monkey answer, yes, Ranulfo, this is higher than the first one, presses this push button and get reward. This is what the monkey does. One day, I gave a lecture, and I said that the monkeys were rewarded and were tequila. And uh, one of the, <laughs> of the persons came to me that was a French working in Marseille and tell me, listen, Dr. Romo, eh, what kind of tequila brand do you use to reward the monkeys? So I gave a very large list of tequila, <laughs> and my wife by behind me and said, Ranulfo, don't say that because the people believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Some sorry, they are rewarded with apple juice or water. Or, uh, sometimes we need to find out their preferences in some of the trials and monkey has to compare this with this, and we ask exactly the same, and the monkey says no, and presses the other push button, and they are rewarded. And at the end, we do it. The monkey works a lot, a lot in doing this, and just by manipulating the two quantities, the first and the second stimulus, and by Manipulating the differences in frequency between the stimuli, you can have this number of percent, percentage. For example, the, second, the first stimulus is manipulated here, and the, second, and, 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 the, and the first one is fixed, and the second one is, the second one is fixed, and the first is manipulated, or the second one is manipulated, and the first one is fixed. And you can see the numbers, 98%, when the monkey compared 30 versus 20, very simple, or 10 versus 20. The numbers start to change and to decrease of the correct percentages of responses when the differences are very, very short. For example, 20 versus 20, the monkey is just simply guessing. And you take the same numbers and you get what is called a psychometric curve, exactly the same, almost 90% of correct responses in the extremes of the upper and lower uh, arm of the curve. Problems are in the middle, and these are discrimination thresholds in hertz, 2.6 for the monkey, which is the 75% of the upper branch and 25% of the lower branch. And the beauty of this is this curve comes from another subject. This is a human subject, the green one. This is a subhuman primate. The threshold for this fellow is 2.9 versus 2.6, which means that it's not doing as perfect as the monkey. This curve comes from myself, working exactly with the same apparatuses in the same conditions. And I would have thought, with some training, I could be as good as the monkey. We haven't done that yet, but it, I, I could be surprised because this curve was taken about 20 years ago. Probably I have deteriorated and I could be worse than the monkey. But this tells you something fundamental, that probably the same nerve structures are used by the human, by the two primates, to solve the task. Is this is true. The monkey brain is a very good subject to understand problems like this. This is the whole universe for the monkey. Prove down, key down, first stimulus, the delay, comparison, responding with, uh, with the pressing the push button, etc., etc. And the questions that I want to answer today are three very simple ones. I want to be sure that I'm not abusing of your time. Yes. 
I think we are on time. Okay, thank you. First question, which is in the domain of physiologists. Physiologists like to understand how information, sensory input, are represented in, in, the, in, the, in, brain, in the responses of brain cells, no matter what is the metrics you use, intracellular or extracellular, or even large scale uh, recordings, in no matter whether it's in primary afferents, subcortical structures, or in the, in, in, in the cerebral cortex. So I like very much this question because the stimulus is so simple that you can have an idea how nerve cells encode the stimulus patterns. The second question, which is more in the domain of cognitive science, is once the stimulus is gone, where in the brain is represented? Stimulus is gone. How do nerve cells, for example, represent this information, which is called working memory because it's a very short period of time nerve cells or circuits have to represent this information to do the comparison against the second one, because here, not only this information has to be represented as the first one, but needs to be compared against the memory trace of the first one. So I will try to answer with this very simple model what we have found over the last uh, more than 20 years, of course. So this is the monkey brain. It has also two hemispheres the right and the left. Right eye is here, right ear is here, and the neck is here. And the good thing for us is that this brain has the central sulcus that divides <coughs> the anterior part of the brain in the posterior part. And this territory beginning here in the mesial part of the hemisphere up to here is called the primary somatosensory cortex, which is comprises, comprises in areas 3B1 and 2. And the beauty for us, anatomist has done a wonderful job. And the territories of this cerebral cortex are very well known. And we know that this part corresponds for um, mapping information coming for finger D1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So easily we can go with our microelectrodes and do recordings of cortical cells from these areas as the monkey is doing the task. So everything is reduced to a small patch of the skin where we know are the cutaneous receptors innervated by the primary afferents that send the information to the upper part of the spinal cord, thalamus, and finally, to the cerebral cortex, if you are in stimulating D3, so you can go easily to D3 and go across layers, across columns, and whatever you want. So the first question is whether with the primary somatosensory cortex is enough to solve this task. And the first thing we see is these are the dots, have to be read from the left so the right, this is correspond to one trial. First stimulus is always 20, and the second one varies. This doesn't happen, doesn't happen like this in the real experiment. Everything is mixed up, and there are some other types of stimuli to avoid that the monkey do crazy things because the monkey they go to the labs as humans do to uh, lie. They want to get reward without doing properly the task. So I don't know whether you have seen that in, in the lab once. I've, I've seen this with a monkey. I don't know whether humans do exactly the same. But th the beauty of this is that, that you can see that there is a responsive patterns almost uh, fixed, rigid, to the first frequency. And whereas this one varies, there is probably nothing in before, in between the two stimuli, and even after 
the uh, stimulus, the one response. If you zoom up just for one uh, pattern, one frequency for the two stimuli and you repeat, you will see that the neuron responds to this neuron in this case to the touch in a very uh, rapid way. This is a rapid adapting neuron and then uh, is face lock to the sine wave for this frequency and then is, is face lock to. So this is a isometric representation because the metrics of the stimuli are there represented in the firing rate. And this is very nice. And you can use whatever metric you like. And this by itself is another talk because we have trying to, to go into the neural code. And I have no time to go into this because it's, it requires a different <laughs> talk. But I can use this metric. For example, you can take a very simple rule and measure the, the distances which are transformed to time. And you will see that this uh, is times are very rigid as they are here. And so you can have time one and time two and do a very simple operation as the monkey does like this. If time one is higher than time two, then the frequency of the second stimulus is higher than the first one. And when you do the neurometrics, at least for this neuron, and for what the monkey is doing, and uses this metric just by producing two response distributions, it's a very simple receiving operating uh, 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 computation, you will see that these values produce a neurometric curve that almost follow the uh, psychometric curve in such a way that when you use the whole population that is almost one to one, which means that this encoding might be important, not only for representing the stimuli, but also for doing the operations that require to solve this task. And this is what I want to show now. The first question we did is say, well, is that true that this, is, this response is important for uh, not only for encoding the stimuli, but for solving the task? And the question came very simple. One day, one of my students did wrong the experiment and destroyed the circuit. And of course, the experiment ended there because the monkey, there was, there was no more input of the stimula, stimulus represented in the activity of brain cells. So the experiment is there. So this is a very nice technique because if you remove the cells and through to the waste, that's end the experiment. Yes. So we thought differently ourselves that eventually we can substitute the, one of the mechanical stimulus by uh, exciting <coughs> the neurons that were mapping the stimulus so that tiny electrical currents inserted to a group of neurons in half the trials. So the question was whether the monkey could feel or have delusion that there was something fluttering in the skin. So from trial to trial, the first stimulus was mechanical and the second could be mechanical, could be electrical, and everything was mixed up. We never told the monkey that we were going to do this experiment. It's simple one day, we did the experiment, and this is what happened. Again, you see this? The orange curve is what it comes when the two stimuli are mechanical, and when the second one was substituted by electrical currents, you will see that practically the curves are indistinguishable, which means that such a way that trained part of the brain, that circuit, was producing a signal that could be read almost normally in the same way as with the natural stimulus to do the working memory and the comparison process. When we published this paper, I do remember quite well one student came to my lab and said, listen, and we have discovered that we can excite the, and produce this cognitive. And he said to me, because that's normally. And we published that paper in, in Nature. And so what? And then, so what do we do? We did more things. We, we even 
uh, substituted the two stimuli, and everything was dormant there. And one day I discovered, because I was traveling and was talking to someone, and I discovered that there was a very new discipline, neuroprothesis, prosthetics, that assumed that you could read from the activity of brain cells something you can uh, feed this signal to, to the brain or to apparatuses to do something, neuroprosthetic. And so, so after 20 years, I became more comfortable and happy that that silly experiment that was proving that the representation of the stimulus served to something. Of course, now the people say that you can insert even memories by inserting information to brain cells in different parts of the circuits. And I go for the second part of my talk and in what this concerns. So, knowing <coughs> that this information was important, not only for the encoding the stimulus, but for igniting a large network that um, served to solve the task. So we focus on this problem and we went across the cerebral cortex, not only in the primary somatosensory cortex, but to secondary ventral premotor cortex, where Rizzolatti claims there are mirror cells, prefrontal cortex, which was already demonstrated for many, uh, in many ways, that was important for working memory and executive uh, function. And this part of the brain that comprises the supplementary motor cortex and pre-supplementary motor cortex where John Eccles in the early 70s thought and suggested that external uh, signal for the soul could use this path of the tissue to produce conscious voluntary actions. So something that Wolfram Schulz and I in the 80s worked, not thinking like John Eccles, that there was an um, interface between the soul and the brain. But <coughs> there were many ideas that eventually uh, neurons here were associated to planning voluntary action or something like that. And if something was planned, it had to be with memory. It could be a very large uh, network primary motor cortex, of course, because the animal requires not also to make voluntary action to press the push button. And in fact, we did record it in the whole cerebral cortex because we didn't know for this kind of stimuli how and where in the cerebral cortex information was stored in working memory and just want to show four recording of four neurons, which are um, simple uh, references, single references of large population that we have studied in these is four areas. Primary somatosensory cortex, secondary, which we feel is secondary because after the primary, prefrontal cortex, and medial prefrontal cortex, which is com comprises this, the pre-supplementary motor cortex, that is associated with planning voluntary actions. And uh, the color bar here is simple. Uh, how the different stimuli from 10 to 34 hertz. And of course, these colors are associated to the traces, which are no more than expectation spy density, which give you an, uh, um, the probability that the neuron fires um, a function of time. And there is simply, the firing rate, the intensity of the firing. And you will see that neurons in the primary somatosensory cortex respond as a function of the stimulus frequency. It's a very parametric way. If you plot this, you will have um, a plot like this, a positive plot, with almost one-to-one um, -one spike increasing as you add one stimulus here. This came very surprising to us when did recordings in secondary somatosensory cortex, that it happened for the neuron, it happened exactly the same, the opposite. It responded the boss with the lowest frequency and the least with the highest. And we quickly discovered that there were two populations reading exactly the same input from primary somatosensory cortex, one encoded in a negative way like this and the other like this. 
And so when we wanted to do neurometric curves using the same approach, we failed. Every population was below the capacity to solve the task. So we were very much surprised until we discovered that the two populations were sharing common noise. And by sharing, by doing a very simple subtractions, the fraction was enough to produce a neurometric curve, almost exactly I like here. So this are, there are two populations, and it happens exactly for the rest of the brain. This is very nice in the prefrontal cortex. By the way, I use this simply because this activity, this encoded in ladies, the early part of the working memory period, which is the period where the, the cells might store the information. And, uh, and they are doing almost in the same way. But look at the, the beauty in the prefrontal cortex. These neurons are practically discriminating differences between 34 to 10 hertz and the distances between the other frequencies. So the stimulus was here, the stimulus ended here, and the neuron uh, were persistently working. This phenomena was, of course, discovered in the early 70s by Joaquin Foster and Niki in Japan. And we show uh, persistent activity once the stimulus is gone. The only difference is that neither Foster or Niki could tell what about this. I think the only experiment comparable to this was the one by Goldman Rakish for mapping the memory field in the space, <laughs> which is very nice. And the other day I brought a short note for trains in neuroscience we, who are trains in neuroscience trying to celebrate some seminal papers that happened many years ago. And what, what was this, this state of the art for doing that experiment? How was the experiment done? And what happened after that? The paper is still alive. It's very nice because it, it maps information about the visual space once the stimulus is gone. And so that experiment ignited many ideas. In fact, it ignited also the possibility that the stimulus parameter could be encoded in working memory, the quantity. And this is very important for the people that do neurocomputation because they have re reliable data in order to have to feed the circuits and to model how information in the circuit in the brain might be stored. And this one is very interesting because it's a simple state dormant during the delay period, what is called working memory. But just before the second stimulus that happens here, the neurons start to fire. So if a um, psychologist come to me will say, Romo, simply this is an expectation cell because it's representing the expectation to the second stimulus. And even all these can be associated to reward whatever, whatever you want. But the beauty of this is that it's very similar to this one. It, if you do this, use this information, you have a parametric negative curve like this. Of course, the other cells that do the opposites are here, as here, and as here. Here you have also the negative, positive. So everything becomes a very simple neural code that represents information once the stimulus is gone. And to me, it was very good because it helped me to continue my work. Because if there was a different way to represent the information, it could have been a nightmare in my career, and I couldn't be with you this morning at Collège de France. So I will go for the last part. So I know how information during the first stimulus is represented and during the working memory. It's not different. By the way, for a simple uh, phase lock card, you can extract also the stimulus frequency, and which is also what you get in a fire and write code during the working memory. But now here, how do information from the second and the past are combined to produce a comparison and a decision process. I think this is key to understand perception. You perceive things, if you have experience, by something that you have stored in your brain with something which is coming immediately. And the two are compared. 
sometimes dominates the sensory inputs, sometimes dominates the, the experience. I do remember when I was with Bernard Mountcastle, he was already in the 70s, and he said, Renulfo, I want to go. Where, where do you want to go, Vernon? I want to leave John Hawks. Why? Because all my friends are dead. And so uh, I do remember quite well that a punk came to the elevator and Vernon was shocked. And I said, so, but I, was, I didn't see him, you know, because everything is in my memory. But uh, he was telling that I want to leave, you know, but because everything dominates my life. So, in this case, monkeys do the task by balancing the sensory input with what they have in working memory. In fact, it's long-term memory because the circuit has been trained as, as a circuit, a large circuit is trained for a medical doctor, an engineer, or a scientist even, because by training our circuits, we produce facilitated synapses, a probably night network, and every time that comes a problem, you solve the problem by igniting the circuitry and, and doing the task. And this is what the monkey does. You know, it's the, the, a large system is trained, and every time the stimulus comes, it's ignited and solves the task. And this is what I'm trying to show you. And the, the key issues here is, the second stimulus, because if there is a comparison, a combination between the experience and the sensory input, that might happen during the second stimulus. And this comes, the raster plots come from secondary somatosensory cortex for the first stimulus, which are the, the frequencies, they, everything is plot. Something happens here, three seconds before, and just by simple plotting the firing rate as a function of the stimulus frequency, you get this plot, a positive uh, uh, line, and this corresponds to variability, which variability is very important. And you can have a very simple coefficient, which is no more than an indicator of the responsiveness of this neuron when you add when you are increasing the frequency and tell you 1.3 means that every time that you add a, a sine wave or a pulse, the neuron increases 1.3 spikes, which in real life never happens. It's a simple and statistical measure. It might be 0 0.7, 0 0.5, or 1, or 3, or 4, etc. But after uh, having the, the the median firing rate, you get this measure, and the idea is to have, to decode from this neuron, information about, not only to the second stimulus, but something that happens before, which are other metrics. And to do this, we have this simple uh, planar plot. And do remember now that coefficients for the first stimulus here can be positive, like this, or negative as the other one I show, or positive for the second, or negative for the second. So, and if there were a comparison cell, there has, there has to be in the diagonal by comparison. For this one, it's simple. It's responding to the second one and nothing to the first one. And exactly happens for the first one. And there is no anticipation of what's going to happen for the second one. But in the same circuit, you get these neurons. And look at this, this is the beauty. These two are differential. They are responding more when the monkey says that the second stimulus is higher than the first. But excuse me, when the se second stimulus is, is responding that the second is lower than the first than when the second one is higher than the first. And look at this, 26 versus 26, 22 versus 22, 18. So they are... They are no longer following the log logic of the stimulus frequencies. They are simple, telling something fundamental. And when you plot this, as we did before, they are differential. And if you do the same analysis, you will see that they are lying in the diagonal. By comparison, this is a comparison cell. And, of course, 
another population do, does exactly the same. Look at this, this respond the most than the first one, but when we did the same analysis as the neuron before, we found this does not lie, lies exactly in the diagonal and why. So we did an analysis, um, a very fine analysis across time, and we found that the neuron first walks from the horizontal axis, encoding information about what happens before. For all the neurons of the monkey, did more or less like this. So the monkey was caring, not forgetting the information of the first stimulus. And once he stored the information, he started to combine with the second one, and that's the reason why the neuron rotates. But this time, the neuron is encoding information about the two. And immediately before the end of the stimulus, the neuron comes to the diagonal. It's a beautiful, it's a dynamical problem. So this is the beauty of doing experiments in this type, because at the end, most of the neurons, what they do, they go by the vertical axis and they rotate to diagonal, either here or here. And this is very nice. So, but at the end, the monkey is solving the task in the same way. With this method, we then we went across areas, many areas, and from very simple representations in primary somatosensory cortex, there becomes a dual representation of the same information, positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative, and nothing in the motor cortex. And once the stimulus is won, these are the areas that hold information permanently during two seconds, exactly in the same format. Beautiful. Even there are even few cells, but this area is not associated to work in memory. And when the second stimulus comes, this is sensory, like this, because it's to the second stimulus, positive. And again, information about, during the second stimulus, you can decode information about the, the second, the positive, negative. Information about the working memory component is negative, positive, and the differences and the comparison, which lie beautifully in the diagonal. And look at this, all these areas are associated with the same process. And even in the primary motor cortex, you have the neurons that are instructed to report the decision process, not associated to the uh, action of the motor action. They are reading what these areas decided to do and instruct a population of motor cells, the primary motor cells, to express this. And the beauty of this is that is very good for us. There are many areas associated to work in memory. If, for example, someday I arrive home and my wife is angry at me and hits my head, and if I had only one work in memory area, that would be too bad. But look at this for the monkey. There are four. So, I would say that is more or less what happens in the generation. When we express Parkinsonism, we already lost 80% of the neurons, dopamine cells for this market. So what happens before? There is a compensation, probably, and the syndrome starts to be expressed when we have a very tiny capacity to react. This is probably the same in, in, in memory diseases in which we start to lose working memory circuits, little by little. So at the beginning, we have 10, last, just to say. And then we lose two. We have eight. We do very well. But then we lose five. And you say, the other day, Ranulfo came to Collège de France to give an opening lecture for El Colegio Nacional. And suddenly, he was uh, interacting with that, and then he started to speak in Spanish. On the other day, I met him in the street, and he asked me several times for my wife. So, and by the end, when you are left with only two circuits, you are express everything. So the question is, how is this conjoined activity works to hold information, transitory information, to do our mental operations? It's a matter of, of work 
in which we are trying to do by doing simultaneous recordings of not only one single area, but many cortices. And it exactly happens for decision making. You have to have all the ingredients represented here, the sensory inputs of the second, the working memory, which is the experience, and the result of this computation which lies in the diagonal. And this is, a, I like this picture because even if it is, is, is taken in a very painful way, little by little, it gives me a representation of how information flows across the cortex and how is this transformance to be associated with uh, this computational thing. This is the, almost the last, there is only one slide left, and this is what we've been doing, doing simultaneous recordings of many cortical areas as the monk is doing the task. I'm just showing here five cortical areas and, uh, and what you get here is some messy of spikes and colors. So the monkey does very nicely the task and when we represent this just simply in, in raster plot, it's simply annoying because you don't see anything as you don't see anything as in the first picture when I showed the brain. There is no representation of anything in the tissue. It's been a very uh, painful way for many years trying to find out representation or dynamic representation, which is in this case. But we've been working very hard over the last 10 years, very unsuccessful. We have some other aside problems just to, to eat scientifically, produce papers, not to be taken out from our institution because we don't produce papers. But the other day, we produced this one in which not going across the whole population, but we took a very large population of 1,500 cells recorded with have a very high heterogeneity, as I showed before. And we managed to decode information in a very synthetic way, what the neurons do during the stimulus, during the working memory, comparison and decision making. So we are very um, uh, motivated by this uh, fact. We took about 17 years to do this, I don't know why. But uh, we managed to produce this and, uh, and I think that by mixing sometimes techniques and ideas, eventually we can to across to the code how the brain does to solve very simple tasks and eventually very complex tasks as Stanley Lies does in his last lab using large scale recordings in, in the human brain. And with this, I end my talk and thank you very much for votre attention. <laughs>